Welcome to Season 5 of Four Quarter Lives, a podcast exploring the profound impact of longer lives and careers on everything, countries, companies, couples, and careers. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and this season will be starting by investigating the scary, exciting, and urgent topic of career change. Why is it so terrifying? How can we do it better? And why and how can companies help their talent to transition more smoothly across our lengthening 60-year career spans? Thanks for all your support and listening over the past year. We love all the feedback and reactions. Keep it coming, and let's get started with 2024. On this week's Four Quarter Lives, I talk with Richard Alderson, CEO of Career Shifters. After his own feeling of serious stuckness in his 20s and his subsequent successful and life-changing shift, Richard Alderson has devoted his career to convincing people that they can successfully change careers. He spent the last decade working with thousands of individuals and companies. In this podcast, he shares his learning and data. For example, what are the two big issues that block career shifters? What are the six phases of transitions that people go through when moving? And what's the single most important success factor of a career shift? Happy 2024. Welcome to season five. Feeling stuck? Listen up. Okay, Richard Alderson, welcome to Four Quarter Lives. Delighted to have you. Likewise, delighted to be here, Eva. So we're going to talk talk all things career shifting, but we're going to start because you have already experienced this very personally. We'll start with your own story and how you came to create this company and the service called Career Shifters. So when and where did it start for you? Yeah, so it started in my late 20s. I was in a conventional corporate career working in technology consulting. That covers a lot of the globe. Yep, that covers a lot of people listening, I'm sure. (laughs) And my levels of dissatisfaction and disillusionment with my work were just increasing on a day-to-day basis. This has started a few years earlier, but it's just been building. It got to the point where there were signals all around me that something was fundamentally wrong. And what going kind to, of things? How might somebody listening recognize? Like, Yeah, so I was going to parties. People would ask me the inevitable question, so Richard, what do you do? And I hated that question because I had absolutely zero passion or alignment with what I did. And so answering that just brought all of that to the fore and I wanted to avoid that kind of answer and that question. So that was one signal. Second signal was looking at my boss and my boss's boss and their boss and asking myself, do I really want those roles? And the answer was categorically no, or there wasn't a lot of excitement around that. And then finally, the thing that I also noticed was a sense of fear of reaching the end of my life or retirement or wherever that that landed and looking back on my career and feeling I'm not going to feel proud about what I've done in my career if I continue on this path. So those were the signals that were very present for me. What was also clear was I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And I felt a huge amount of fear about stepping off the ladder that I've been climbing in that career into the unknown. I fear the story covers a hell of a lot of people around the world. I mean, so many people could say exactly what you've just said. Yeah. A depressing Uh, number. Yeah. Ostensibly, I had a great job. There was nothing wrong with the job itself. There's nothing wrong with the company that I worked for. On paper, it all looked great. But inside, I was deeply unhappy and getting more so. And not just unhappy, but also as I started to look at what else might be possible, I had a feeling of being trapped and a huge amount of fear about what else I could do. So I went into a period of quite deep unhappiness, showing up to work, going through the motions, going home, trying to figure things out, waking up the following day and going back in this, what I call groundhog day reality of dragging myself to work like a zombie and really not being happy at all. And to cut a very long story short, I made pretty much every single mistake in the book about how not to go about making a career change, but eventually through trial and error, did do some things that really worked. And they led me to my next career, which was quite radically different. So I shifted from a huge company, a huge corporate, into a tiny startup social venture in London that was pioneering the support of early stage social entrepreneurs. So quite different. Equally, I was able to bring the consulting experience that I'd had. So I had some skills that I could use. Equally, at the same time, I had a very high learning curve as well to get up to speed with what I needed to do, but I was able to, through my enthusiasm for this new area, 
and through some of the skills I could bring, make a, a case for being employed in that type of organization. And very, very fortunately, I was able to do that. And really since then, I've never looked back in terms of feeling a level of fulfillment and excitement about my career. And it's uh, taken me into all kinds of different places, moving to India and helping co-founding a similar incubator for social entrepreneurs there. And also that transition led to the inspiration for Career Shifters, which was really born out of what I was really craving at the time. When I was sat at my desk, feeling deeply unfulfilled, deeply unhappy, deeply trapped, deeply stuck, I was craving a single place online where I could go and find, first of all, inspiring stories of people who'd made successful shifts. Secondly, practical expert guidance about what to do to go through this process. And thirdly, a place to connect with other people like me going through the journey, but also experts that could could help me. And there was nothing at the time that fulfilled any of those things. And so that's really where the idea came from. It was very much supported by my experience of speaking to friends and colleagues, so many of whom expressed the same kinds of emotions to me, saying, look, I am also frustrated. I I do want to do something different. I don't know what else that is. And so it started to form the idea in my head that, Hmm, there's something here that could be usefully brought into the world. As I further explored this issue, what I saw as well were some more macro trends that were definitely present then. And this we're talking now almost a couple of decades ago, but even more prevalent now, which still form the context in which we do our work. And there, there are three things. Firstly, working lives lengthening. Secondly, the pace of change increasing in the world, particularly led by technology. And thirdly, an increasing desire, an increasing ability for us to do work that is purposeful and meaningful. And all of that is leading to a world where we are going to be wanting to and often needing to change careers more often. Yeah. So that's the bigger context in which our work sits. Longer careers, maybe 60-year careers, tech and constant rapid change, and this growing hunger for purpose at work, which is really spreading like wildfire. Not that it's never not existed, but you're actually giving it credence and saying we're allowed to search for that. And so it sounds like you helped an awful lot of social entrepreneurs get started in a couple of different countries, and then you became one. Is that what I'm hearing? (laughs) That you learned how to do it, told others how to do it, and then took your own advice? Yeah. uh, When did you make that leap, and how did you do that? So I made the leap from the small social organization in in London in 2007. So I'd been working there three years. I had an, an amazing time there learning a lot about social entrepreneurs, but also being inspired by them. And so I think that was the final catalyst for me to then say, look, I think I have an opportunity now to set up some things myself. I worked with a remarkable co-founder and set up the incubator in India doing something similar. And at the same time, I also set up, or a little bit beforehand, I set up Career Shifters. Initially, it was run mostly by another team. And then I stepped back into it about nine years ago, full time. Okay. So I'm going to pick your brains about everything you've learned in the last nine years (laughs) about career shifting and particularly career shifting at midlife. So it's interesting. You described your own experience, which I think you had much younger, which I think sounds to me a lot like what I hear about people at midlife sounds like you were just a quick learner. <laughs> this, this corporate world made, was obviously not a fit for you. Correct. Tell me about what you've learned at midlife. How does it feel? Why is it so emotional? And what do you observe with the people who come to you? And what age range do you cover? I think you're, you're not focused on midlife. I'm curious about what percentage of the people who come to you are in what people might call midlife. Yeah. So the majority of our audience are between their 30s and their 50s. Within that, the majority in their 40s. So what we've learned is that the two biggest problems they come to us with are firstly, they don't know what else they want to do next. And secondly, they have a huge amount of fear about making a change. And so all of our work is... Ignorance and fear. (laughs) Yeah. And is it ignorance? Uh, Ignorance is maybe not quite the right word. It's not a nice Uh, word. But um, they don't... I'm curious to know, is because I was struck by your saying that you really didn't see anybody doing anything you wanted to become. Is this not knowing? Is people just never meet people? 
that inspire them or that give them an idea of something they themselves might want to do? Is it really just a lack of role models around us, which is a bigger issue? It's not. I think that's part of it. I think at the heart of it is the challenge that when you start off in a career and you work very intensively in that world, as many of us do, that's the world that we know. Yeah. And so through no fault of my own, through no fault of the audience that we work with, they often can't simply see beyond that. And really this, this points to one of the root causes of that first challenge that I talked to you about, which is they don't know what else they want to do. Is, and we have a saying that we've seen really was true in this case, which is that you cannot be what you cannot see. Yeah, good one. And this is the heart of our approach is based on what we believe our audience and our clients need to go through, which is a process of innovation with their career. And innovation means coming up with new ideas. And it's very hard to do that in a way that is rational or based on the the way that most of us solve problems, which is by looking at the data in front of us and then coming to a conclusion about that data. And that is essentially a convergent way of tackling a problem. The challenge with most of our audience and the challenge with me was that I didn't have enough data about what else was out there in terms of what was possible for me. And therefore, there was no way that I could converge down on that answer through conventional thinking. This is the fundamental root of innovation is doing new things, getting new inputs into the equation, but also knowing that it's going to be somewhat of a messy process and there are going to need to be failures in inverted commas. And I'm using that very carefully because actually they're not really failures, they're progress along this journey. And if you look at it in other fields with where people need to innovate in the field of, for example, entrepreneurship, which I've come from, or the field of science, This is what entrepreneurs and scientists do day in, day out. If they go off in a particular direction without particularly knowing where that's going to lead them, they notice what is happening when they do that with the actions they've taken, and then they calibrate and say, okay, what have I learned? Do I need to pivot? Do I need to persevere? And go forward in that way. And so you probably love Amy Edmondson's latest book. I don't know if you've seen it called The Right Kind of Wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's all about a celebration of we have to learn to be readier to do what some people call failures. Not very many entrepreneurs call trying and experimenting. Exactly. Failures. And I think your brilliance is to use that word of innovation. I think it's a hip word. Everybody wants to be innovative and yeah. it gives permission to, I think what you're also really contrasting is in the past, I think in terms of career shifting, people were invited to look inwards and think about insight and think deeply about themselves. But the younger you are, the more hopeless that is because you just don't know yourself until you're much, much older. And even then, some of us never get there. And you're really arguing for outside that you got to go and discover new worlds, gather new data and see new ideas in order to find a potential match, particularly if you're past. It's kind of like the AI conundrum, right? If you put old garbage into the system, you're never going to come up with new ideas. A hundred percent. And what I would say, and this is really important too, is that there is absolutely a place for introspection, for reflection in this process. You can't just do the action-based learning work without the learning bits. So it's really important. But what we've seen is that And certainly what our clients tell us is that just reflecting alone is not sufficient because you're reflecting within what you know and you've got to do new things. You've got to take new actions, which means meeting new people, having new experiences, stepping out of your reality bubble in a way that starts to bring new inputs in. The author Seth Godin talks about this. He says, ideas occur when dissimilar universes collide. And so this is what we help our clients do. And and There are three principles that we've pulled together that we've found to be particularly helpful for people to to take on board. The first principle is exactly what I've talked about, which is don't figure this out, act it out. So get your head out of the list, get your head out of Google, get your head out of job sites. Yes, stop applying for dumb jobs you don't uh, want. Get your head out of career books, even career articles. Heck, we put a lot of articles out there, but get into action in ways that allow you to get outside of your reality bubble, to meet new people, have new experiences, step into new environments in a way that starts to bring new inputs into your life that you can then go, oh, well, that's really interesting. That resonates with me or that doesn't and start to build a more fuller picture of what else is out there. And also at the same time, learn 
the direction in which you're drawn to. And that will be unarguable because you'll start to notice things that really make you feel alive. So that's principle yep. number one. Don't figure it out, act it out. Principle number two is don't look for jobs, look for people. That's a good one. Yeah, it's very tempting. And I did this myself to default to saying, well, if I'm looking for a new career, I'm looking for a job and therefore I need to get on the job sites. I need to speak to recruiters. But what inevitably is going to happen is that you are going to get channeled back into what you are doing currently. Why? Because when recruiters look at you, they're going to immediately typecast you by what's at the top of your CV or LinkedIn profile and channel yep. more of the same towards you. And on job sites, what you're going to see are things that, first of all, may be really interesting, but very different. And then you can look at what they require and go, well, I don't have that. And that's going to feel pretty soul sucking or you're going to be drawn and therefore you're going to be drawn back to stuff you've already uh, naturally done. So it can be a very dangerous process to get stuck in that job hunting process if you want to do something quite different. I sort of align with that. Many people also start by saying, well, I need to update my CV. And the challenge with that is that it's very hard to update your CV before you know what it is that you want to do next. And it's also not a great document, frankly, to lead with when you're yeah. making a career change, because it's essentially, and we like to affectionately call it, a list of things you don't want to do anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, and again, it's... That's it's good. It is going to be relevant at a certain point, but not at the starting point of that journey. And yep. and so we try again, try to guide our audience away from relying too much on that. So so traditional job hunting less useful. And instead, what we've seen is much more useful is looking for people. Why? Because people can open you up to, first of all, a whole range of different fields, not just fields and roles, but also ways of working. It's amazing when I... When I pull back the kimono, essentially, after when I started to have conversations with people who were doing very different things from what I was doing in my very conventional corporate career, I was blown away by how much was out there in terms of not just different roles, but ways different people worked, more entrepreneurially, with portfolio careers. Like just There's a whole different plethora of ways that people have crafted making a living that is yeah. often hidden yeah. from us, that yeah. is revealed through people. That's the first reason. Second reason is that when you speak to people, you start to be able to present yourself in a way you can't do on paper. So you circumnavigate all the challenges that come with your CV. And then finally, what inevitably happens is that as you start to communicate with more and more people, you start to identify the areas that you're really energized by, people start offering you opportunities because yeah. ultimately every single opportunity is connected to a person. And certainly in smaller organizations, many of those opportunities are not also traditionally advertised. And so you're going to be able to open up opportunities in the job market yeah. as well. So, so those are all the benefits of looking for people, people. in jobs. Yep. And then the third principle, really importantly, is don't do this alone, do it with others. What we've seen is that this process of going through a process of innovation in your career is hard, is counterintuitive to the way that we go about problem solving generally, as I said earlier. And as such, and also because this is such a period of, of fear and uncertainty, going through this process with others is the accelerator. And when I say others, I mean a variety, ideally, of different characters or personas. So firstly, people who've done it already, so mentors. Secondly, experts who have some insight into different fields or different parts of this career change journey. Thirdly, peers, people who are also going through this process. Fourthly, people who can be motivators for you that can pick you up in times of challenge emotionally as inevitably will come up in this journey. So when you can build a support team around you, you're going to move faster. And this is not something that we've invented. We see this in multiple other fields of people going through essentially transformational processes in their lives. And it's been proven in those other fields that doing this with others is the faster way and more effective way to do this. Those are the three principles that we've learned really hold true for, for making a successful shift. I think those are absolutely fantastic and a wonderful short summary. So act it out. Don't look for jobs, look for people and don't do it alone. Find mm -hmm. yourself a transition team Christ. to get through this movement. Yeah. I think that's blissfully simple and somewhat innovative, strangely, because you're right. People don't usually do that. Why don't they do that? Why is this feel like it's non-obvious? I think it's to do with the way that we're educated. Our education system is not built for the kind of world of work 
and indeed world of change that we now live in. It's something that we would like to to have an influence on longer term in what we're doing as an organization. But at the root of this, and this this speaks to the second challenge that we work on is, is we are not educated to make changes. We're educated in a very traditional way that expects us to have linear careers. And that's just not the case anymore. And so we need to be adaptable. We need to be comfortable with change. And it's inherently uncomfortable for us human beings. But there are things that we can do that make us better at making changes. And that's a lot about what, again, the way that we work with our clients is to help them develop the mindset that they need to not only make their next career change, but also make future shifts, which are going to be more and more likely for them in their lives. And that, and there's a lot of different components of that. There's definitely a confidence component. There's a component around agency, which means really t- believing that, that they can make choices about how they work, but also knowing that they can then, through some of the techniques we've talked about, go ahead and make those changes by reaching out to people, by doing the different things that we've talked about. There's a mindset around being comfortable with failure or dead ends, knowing that that is part and parcel of a change process. There's a there's a mindset around being comfortable, feeling uncomfortable, yeah. which again is part and parcel of this process. Yeah. And so I think that our education system doesn't touch on any of this currently. And really, whilst at the surface of our work, we're helping people find direction for their next chapter, the deeper work that we're doing is really helping people feel equipped to make changes in their lives. And so many of our clients come back to us and say, actually, this is impacting other areas in my life in a really positive way because I feel more confident about change, about uncertainty. And boy, have we experienced a lot of that recently. So so yeah, that's how, and again, there's the same accelerators that I talked about earlier in terms of surrounding yourself with people, having uh, coaches around, and also having some content and models that can help people understand this can are accelerators in this process for people. So as I listen to you about, you know, getting over the fear, becoming comfortable with discomfort, yeah. uh, having a whole new mindset, I can't help asking, given my specialty, if there's a gendered version of this. I know there's a bit of a disbalance in many programs like this, where we attract more women who seem to be much more ready to put all their vulnerabilities on the table and work their way through it. Then men, what do you think? Have you observed this? And what's the underlying issue? When you say what's the underlying issue, what do you mean specifically? I just I wonder what is the balance on your programs? What's the gender balance yep. that you see coming yep. through? How yep. do you explain it? Is it a marketing issue of making these programs and the shift you're talking about attract equally attract like I think using the word innovation is mm. very smart and very kind of mm. what I would call gender bilingual. That's something mm. that men would mm. be very attracted to. I think yeah. I've been told that midlife is not a word that many men appreciate as a, as a word <laughs> yeah. itself. So I'm just curious if you're a little specialized, have you made, I, I imagine you've given all this some thought. You have a lot of data you're collecting. Are yeah. there any differences you've observed? And is it a marketing issue or is it actually an embracing of change itself issue? I think it's the latter, more so. Yeah. So first of all, in answer to your question, what's the gender balance on our programs, really across our audience, it's two thirds women, a third men. Which is also very common elsewhere. So I think that's pretty, yeah. pretty standard statistic. And I just Yeah. Yeah. And I think some of the gender stereotypes certainly apply and equally things are changing. So women are, in terms of what they tell us, more open to change, more open to because of the nature of having to deal with different changes in their life, being a mother, if that's something that they take on, being a caregiver. They're more open to asking for and receiving help about emotionally rooted challenges, of which this is very much one of those. They are also, because traditionally, and again, this is definitely changing, they are less likely to be the, or at least in the past, less likely to be the main breadwinner. They have fewer concerns around or yeah. th- that than a male might do. So, yeah. so all I think all of those things play into the fact that there are just more women who are open to this kind of thing. And equally, we have lots and lots of men as well. And 
more anecdotally, some of the things that I observe around the men that we work with is that they sometimes have been coached before, maybe in other contexts, so maybe in a sporting context, for example, so they're open to getting outside help from that perspective. Really seeing this as something that, where they can do this better, perform better through a process of get to an outcome faster. And equally, we also see many men who've had or who've been confronted by big existential questions and therefore are more open to this kind of work. And maybe those that confrontation has come through personal health challenges. Maybe it's come through yeah. loss of a loved one. Maybe it's come through other sudden life changes. Life quakes. Survivors of life quakes. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Shakes things up. Fascinating. Have you found any way to increase the number or attractivity of the service to men? Is there some suggestions you might have or of what? I think we're still learning on this. And I think so much of this, and this is why we have more than 500 stories on our site, is about storytelling. I think the more men can see other men who've made shifts, large or small, the more that they're going to be inclined to think that they can do the same. And and look, that was what I was looking for. That's why I said by the beginning. that I'd actually question that. I This may be a gender stereotype, but in my experience, yeah. women are very open to storytelling. They really love stories. I find men are much more interested in data. Like if you shared the nine years of data, the success rate, the return on investment, the how many of them got the kind of, I would find that something. Now I want to get there, but first, before yes. I get to the data and what are you yes. going to share with us about yes. how many people successfully shifted? Yeah, I know you've mapped out these six different stages of career change. Can you just share them? Because I think it's that whole arc and the time that this takes. A lot of people who come to me seem to want this. I want to get this done by spring and I want to be in my new job by June. Um, <laughs> what do you tell them and how do you pace them through these phases? Yeah. Okay. So let me just address the time question first and then I'll come through the, to yep. the phases. So the simple fact is career change takes time. What we've learned and what I would say to anybody coming to us is that you would need to budget at least six months to go through the exploratory process that's going to lead you to a place of having greater clarity about what else you can do. Now, of course, some a few people do that a lot faster, but that that's a time period to bear in mind. Why is that time period important? Because there are lead times when you are going through a process of innovation, which necess- necessitates you to be stepping out of your reality bubble, meeting new people, having new experiences. There are lead times to that process that you can't accelerate. And there are also a number of dead ends you've got to go through, again, being in that process of innovation, and that takes time. So that's that's a time period. Now, beyond that, the actual shift can take a lot longer depending on what you really want to do. So six months to a couple of years is really what we'd say, budget that in your head to go through this process, but get started now on that exploratory process. That's the time period that we've seen. I'd probably add that the older you are, the more that number might go up. And if you hit into the 50s and 60s, give, give yourself three or four years to prepare mm. this kind of t- transition. Yeah. And really importantly, too, it's really important not to conflate. And I'm telling this again to our audience and to our clients on a day-to-day basis, not to conflate making a shift, the actual process of changing career, and exploring your options. Yeah, What we've seen is the most effective thing to do for people in work is to go through the exploratory process while they're in their day jobs without taking any risks whatsoever so that they're in a position where they can say, right, I now know what my exciting viable options are. Now I can make some really big decisions about how and when I make that change. And I think that puts off a lot of people when they can fade the two and say, well, well, if I want to make a career change, I'm going to have to take lots of risks up front. You don't need to do that. So that's another thing that's really important in this process. Coming to the stages, what we've seen over the years that we've been working with people is that there are a number of different stages that people can be at in this journey. And just knowing what stage you're in can help you A, just feel clearer about where you're at in the process, but B, also understand the steps that you need to take to get to the next stage. So it can be quite reassuring to have this kind of map of where you are on the journey. This is why we develop these different stages. And the the first stage is what we call the questioner stage. So I'm I'm going to bring in an example from my story of of each of these stages can be helpful just to illustrate it. But essentially, when I was at my day job, starting to question, hmm, is this really it? Why am I feeling unhappy on a Sunday evening looking at the week of work ahead? 
what's going on? Why, when I look at my boss, do I not feel inspired about what they do? So there's an internal process that is often the, the starting point for this. And then that questioner stage turns into a browser stage. And this is where someone starts to take small actions, but they're not yet committed to making a shift. And so in my story, browsing, I was literally browsing on a web browser and saying, well, what else is out there? Unfortunately, sometimes in the browsing stage, people can very naturally gravitate to things like job sites and things that aren't necessarily going to be helpful, but they're at least starting to take some actions, maybe starting to have a few conversations. But it's all very quite tentative at this stage. Then there comes a point where a browser turns into an explorer. And the explorer stage is where someone is now moving into being committed to making a shift or at least getting some definitive answers about what else could be possible for them that they don't even necessarily know about yet. Yep. So the difference between a browser and an explorer is about commitment. And yep. that when there is commitment, then all kinds of other things start to happen. So there's a much higher level of action taking, there's a much higher level of perseverance through all the assumptions and lack of knowledge that can often come in the way. That's why they come and so, sign up with you at the explorer phase. Yeah, well, actually, people come to us earlier at the browsing stage, too, because they're just sort of curious, well, ooh, well, what's possible and so on. Yeah. But but Explorer, people start to, to take more determined action. That, and when they come onto our courses, they, they are going to be at the Explorer stage because they're making a commitment saying, right, yeah. I'm doing something doing about this. I'm doing yeah. this. Yeah. And yeah. so for me, the me, the point that changed between being a browser and an Explorer was, I remember it still very well, it was a cold February day where I'd had a very uninspiring meeting with my boss. and something, a switch flipped for me. It's like the pain of staying where I am is now exceeding the pain of doing something about this. And I am going to go hell for leather to find out what else I can do because it's too important for me not to do that. So that's when I became an explorer. Then when you go through the explorer stage and you start to explore what else is possible, this is primarily about the what question in career change. Then once you've got some clarity about the what what else you want to do. Then you move into the next stage called the pathfinder stage. And this is about finding a path to that what. Yeah. So this is more about the how question. How do I make this happen? And it's a completely different question because it involves you needing to think about the logistics and the practicalities of making the shift. And for me, once I determined, right, I want to move into the social impact sector and specifically social entrepreneurship, then it was like, well, how do I make that shift? So that's the next stage. And then once someone's gone through the pathfinding stage and found the path to what it is that they want to do, then they become a shifter. They've shifted. There are challenges in shifting in terms of, well, how do I embed myself in my new career? How do I make the most of the skills I've got? How do I learn rapidly in that space? And for me, that was very much the case in my new role in the social organization I moved into. And then beyond that stage, some people move into a mentor stage where they say, well, look, I've been through this experience. It was quite tough. I've learned a lot about myself. My life is measurably better. And I now want to help others based on the experience I've been through. And we have a whole load of our audience who play that role. Of course, everyone on the Christian's team plays that role because everyone in our team yeah. has been through a shift. But equally, many, many of our audience step up within the communities that we have and say, look, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to share my story. I'm willing to provide some guidance, some mentorship to others. And I think that's a really... I think that's thing. a wonderful, so questioner, browser, explorer, pathfinder, shifter, mentor. I think just you explaining those out already clarifies and I would imagine helps people not make this a big, huge, challenging mass of a mountain they have to climb, but really just a step, a series of not difficult sub steps if they're ready to commit to getting through them. That's I find really helpful and really nicely designed. So we're coming to the end. I can't go without some data. Okay. So for the for the guys listening, <laughs> you've worked with thousands of people now, and I know you're a data, a data buff too. What have you learned? What are you looking at? What's most struck you or surprised you? And what's the feedback you get? Yeah, so we collect a lot of data. We're looking to build some of the most comprehensive data on career changes around the world. We're just at the start of that journey. But some of the things that we've learned so far are that for our audience, at least, the biggest reason that people want to make a career change is lack of satisfaction with their role. 
Secondly, the average period that people have been thinking about making a career change is between two and three years, a quite long time, right? So, yeah, that's a long uh, time. And that's really moving from that questioner stage into the browser yeah. stage, into the explorer stage. That's, it's, it's, it's a period of time. I explained the male-female splits. We know approximately 10% of our audience are really interested in doing something on their own, i.e. having their own business. Yep. And really interestingly, we know that about 20% of our audience, actually coming up to almost a quarter of our audience, are really interested in having a job, but also doing something else alongside that. So you might call that a, a side hustle, hustle. You, yeah. you might call it a portfolio career. That is a really popular option when people say, uh, choose that, the answer to that question about what it is that they are interested about doing next. So yeah, so there's some of the things that we are learning about our audience of, of career changes. Yeah. And do you have a percentage of how many successfully or contentedly shift jobs and how happy they are a few years out? Yeah, so it's quite hard for us to track long term yeah. where our audience go. What we do know is about a third of our audience who take our Launchpad course six months after the course have made a successful shift. And about 80% of the remainder are making positive actions to getting to where they want to get to. So that's what we know categorically from the, the research that we've done post our our primary offering. Cool. And let's conclude with perhaps just how can people learn more about career shifters? What are some of the program options? And of course, we've included the link to your site and some of these role model case studies that you're sharing will be in the show notes for anybody to track through. But give us an idea of what kind of programs you're running that people could choose between. Yeah, so we specialize in helping people who don't know what else they want to do, uh, find exciting viable options for what next. And we do that in three ways. So we have an introductory workshop, two and a half hours. We run two, three times a month where people can come and learn the process that we've seen really work. Not only that, but also start to identify some of the ingredients that are going to be really important for them in their next career. And also not feel so alone. Be alongside other people who are in a similar boat. So that's the first thing. Second thing, I already mentioned this, is we run something called the, our Career Change Launchpad, which is an eight-week immersive experience where people can apply those principles that I shared earlier. So really not just get stuck in thinking and analysis paralysis, but get into action in a meaningful way to start to get outside the reality bubble, discover new ideas, narrow those down into thematic areas of interest and start to test some initial ideas within those themes they define to end with a much higher level of clarity of direction about where they want to move forward with their career change. And finally, we have an executive program where we work with senior and executives who want to, again, find really exciting, viable options for the next chapter of their career. Fantastic. Yeah, we also have a whole range of free content on our website, stories, as I mentioned, practical articles. We have a retraining directory, which brings together all the retraining providers that specialize in helping people make career changes. Uh, we have subject matter experts coming on on-demand masterclasses. And we have a career change test, which is something that people can take to identify which stage they're at, uh, which of those stages that I mentioned earlier in their career change journey. And all of that's on uh, our website. Careershifters.org. Take the test if you want to find out, are you a questioner, a browser, or ready to commit on some of the more established phases? Thank you so much for laying all that out. I think you have a really particularly experienced depth of knowledge on this whole new and fast emerging area of careers can change, but you've got to get skilled at how to do it and don't do it alone. I think that's a really important message and you're, you've created a wonderful platform. So I can't well, recommend I, it. I enough. do want to say too, that we are one of many organizations working on this issue. This is a big issue. There are many different angles to come at this from. And the reason that you and I are talking is because there is a phenomenal organization called Phoenix Insight that's put together a, a campaign called Chris Can Change Campaign. It is really about amplifying the message that it is possible to make a career change midlife. And they brought together a phenomenal set of organizations, including mine and yours. Both of us. Uh, and many others that uh, is well worth having a look at as well to, to get a sense of just the diversity and quality of input that many different organizations are providing into this issue. Yes. And I've written about that and we'll actually add that link of all the different organizations in the umbrella that you'll find at careerscanchange.org. 
So Richard Alderson from Career Shifters, thanks so much for your input, your insights. Keep going, do this good work, help people innovate in their careers. Great word. That's the one I'm taking from this conversation. And we'll talk again in your next chapter about how many people you've shifted over the next nine years. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Eva. For more thinking about the impact of our four quarter lives, you can read my column at Forbes and subscribe to my Elderberries newsletter on Substack. Let's design lives that aren't just longer, but better. <laughs>